In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. The most powerful prayer. The prayer is found in the book of John, chapter 17. You know that Jesus Christ, glory be to him, prayed a long prayer on the night before his crucifixion. This is the longest recorded prayer that Christ said on earth. It is Christ's deepest prayer. So much so that one sometimes fears reading it for how deep and meaningful it is. In this prayer, we hear what is going on between the Father and the Son, which is beyond reason, beyond logic, and human understanding. Moreover, this prayer is a school that teaches us how to pray. For as Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, likewise we want to hear his prayer and know how he felt, then become like him and pray in the same manner. Starting from John chapter 13 until the end of John chapter 17, the events take place after the washing of his disciples' feet during Monday, Thursday, the night before Christ's cru- crucifixion. In John chapter 16, verse 32 to 33, Christ said to his disciples, Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come. He is going to be arrested in just so many in two or three hours. That you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. He's telling them not to panic when they see him being hit and snatched away from them. He's reassuring them that everything is worked out. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. This was the last sentence he said to them, and then he began to address the Father and pray. Here Jesus is trying to teach us an important principle, that as much as we talk to others, we should talk to God. Do not let chatter with people take you away from God. Make a balance, because God is truthful and always there. Why would would you let people distract you from God? Why would you rarely talk to God? God deserves that you talk to Him more than people. We note here how spontaneous and smooth Jesus' conversation with people went. After Jesus said this, He looked toward heaven and prayed. There is a rapid shift here. Jesus was talking to people, and suddenly he began talking to God. Praying is not a decision we we take sometimes, prepare ourselves, and rub our eyes to implement. Praying should be very spontaneous. As long as you get used to talking to God, the shift between your presence with people to the presence with God becomes natural and spontaneous. This is evidenced in all men of prayer, in all men of prayer, such as Elijah. Whenever he spoke to people, he said, As the Lord of hosts live, before whom I stand. Does this sound reasonable while he is talking to King Ahab, for example? The answer is that he is in contact with both people and God. In John chapter 17, it says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. What's the story behind raising eyes upwards? You can deal with your senses in the way that helps you pray. Some people can focus more on praying by looking up to the sky like this. Others focus more by closing their eyes. Still others focus more when they kneel down. All are acceptable. Although God is everywhere, not just in heaven, raising eyes upwards always refers to longing for heaven and keep in mind that we don't belong to this world. There is a moment we overlook. This moment is coming when we leave this world and come out of graves on the last day. Then we will fly and and rise toward heaven. When Jesus comes on the clouds, the Bible says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's 1 Thessalonians 4.17. The idea that one day we will rise toward heaven is an inevitable fact that will happen to us. That is, if we are clinging to our Lord. Hence, raising eyes upward toward is an expression of longing for this moment, as if we are wondering when this moment will come, when the world ends and heaven opens and we are let into it, etc. Raising eyes upward is also present in more than one part of the Bible. In the liturgy, a part says, He looked up toward heaven. We have seen many priests raise their eyes upward in this moment during the Eucharist. In John 17, Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. In the first miracle Jesus performed, St. Mary leaned over to Jesus and said, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, My hour has not yet come. In another part, Jesus said, 
For this purpose I came to this hour. We notice that this hour is always in his mind ever since he came to the earth and started his ministry. This hour is the hour of crucifixion. This has a purpose in prayer. A prayer is always prompted by the final moments of life. As long as this moment is in your mind, you will pray more powerfully. Whenever you forget such a moment, you are more likely to lose spirituality in your prayer. The idea that there is an end to come, that we will meet Christ, that this hour will come, we trigger the spirit of prayer. Sometimes we pray languidly because we think that we are going to live forever, yet we know that the end is inevitable. I want to tell you about a psychological feeling I experience. I have been attending church conferences for eight or nine years. Many of those who attend such conferences with me have have now departed. I remember them. May you may you all live long, but we shouldn't be afraid of this topic. I remember, for instance, Nancy, who had cancer and passed away recently. She knew that she would leave soon. At, this, at the last conference, she told me that this was the last conference she would attend and that she came to attend because she probably will not attend any conference again. And so it was. What I want to say is that although we see and meet each other, each one of us will depart sooner or later. This makes us pray heartily, with zeal, and without distraction because serious is the reality. That is, we will meet God at some point. Thus, this feeling is important as it increases focus during prayer and gives value to such prayer. On the contrary, when your prayer becomes a routine performance, know that you have forgotten that suddenly your life will come to an end and the hour will come. Jesus' usage of the word hour doesn't mean the end of life. God is infinite on both the earth and heaven. He refers to the hour he set to redeem mankind. However, for you and for me, there is a certain hour known by God that will inevitably come. It has to come. I want to explain something else to you about the hour that you as servants should comprehend. There is a text in John chapter 5 that is read at funerals, especially funerals of men. Most of the attendees usually don't understand it, so they're just waiting for the deacon to finish reading so they can go home. Yet, this text is rich in meaning. Jesus was talking to the Jews and said very important words. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. John 5.24 We are standing in front of a dead person. That is, we are in a meeting with death that we can't neglect. Through this, Christ brings us to a completely different concept. He says, shall I tell you something that will make you? You not die? We say, tell us, Lord. He who believes my words and follows me shall not die. How can this happen? We already have someone who died. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming. That's verse 25. This has the same meaning as what he was saying about himself as discussed above. Then suddenly his next words are, and now is. What does now mean? We shall see. Let's continue. The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming, in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. That's verse 25 to 28. Now we're confused. Is it an hour, or are there two hours? The first hour has now come. The second hour has not yet come. However, both hours involve death and resurrection. It becomes clear in the meaning of death. When the church says goodbye to one of its sons, it means that his mission has come to an end, and blessed blessed is he if he had heard the, the Lord's voice and followed him. The focus now is on those who who are attending the funeral. This is their hour, right now. What do I mean? If they were dead, they should listen to the Lord's voice and follow him now. Did you get the point? It is our hour. If we don't set out today, this chance might be lost tomorrow. Hence, now is our time. If you are of the dead, 
Open up your ears, listen to the Lord's voice, cling to Him and follow Him so that there shall not be another time for you. You won't be afraid of that. The hour is coming to everyone sooner or later. However, it shall not be intimidating for those who are alive in this hour now. As it is said, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Hebrews 3.15 So the time is now. Does it mean that the resurrection has occurred by saying the hour is coming and now is? No. The Lord means that resurrection is renewed every day for those who repent. Those who listen to the Lord's voice and change their path moved from death to life. Do you understand this idea? This is the function of prayer. When you pray from your heart, you have resurrected. Your good hour has come. For the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. The dead here refers to us, the dead in this world. Thus, one rises when hearing God's voice. Every deep prayer is an hour of resurrection. Consequently, at the hour of your departure, you will be reassured because you rose before. The Lord says in verse 28, Do not marvel at this. Do not be amazed that I'm telling you that now is the time, for the hour is coming. Notice, he doesn't say, for the hour is coming and now is, because the day of resurrection has yet to come, in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. Also notice, he didn't say the dead in this verse so as to distinguish them from the ones in the other verse in which The dead meant all those who haven't repented. Here, to be literal and clear, he refers to all those who are in graves, whether they have repented or not. All who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. That's verse 28 and 29. Jesus started his prayer saying, The hour has come, and we should do the same. Every time we pray, we should consider that the hour has come. Meaning, this hour is an hour of resurrection. This hour is an hour of change. This hour is an hour of repentance. Say, I want to turn to you, Lord. I want to cleave to you, Lord. I want to set out right now because I don't want to fear death. So when my hour comes at any moment, I will be ready. Resurrection from the dead is guaranteed in in this case because I stick with you. So at the beginning of your prayer, when you think of the hour is coming and now is, you are basically saying the time has now come. My hour has come, so I won't think about the time when I'm going to die. I want to rise now from the death of sin, so when I enter the grave, I won't be in any trouble. He who raised Lazarus from the dead will raise me as well. All those in graves will hear his voice and rise. The idea is to wear they shall rise. He doesn't have any problem with that. Those who have risen before this moment, that is the moment when those who are in the graves hear his voice, were of good conduct and have done what is good will rise with God in heaven. And those who have done what is evil and were dead in the world while they were alive will rise to be condemned, that is, to hell. John 12. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? In the Holy Week, Jesus performed many miracles, and many people who loved him came from many areas to see him. Then he felt that he was approaching crucifixion, so he looked up and sent up an arrow prayer, saying, Father, save me from this hour. That's verse 27. So it's okay to fear your hour and ask God to save you from such an hour, for it is a defining moment that will determine your eternal life, whether to the right or to the left. Those who think about this moment and are worried about it are spiritually very wise, and those who forget it aren't wise and are said to be fools. As in Luke 12, 20 says, God said to them, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. This verse, verse 27, means that Jesus came to redeem us, and we live to die at last. Yet death may either lead us to eternal damnation or resurrection to heaven. End of life may either get you in heaven to live happily for billions of years, or 
I would just say, may God have mercy on us and on all. Thus the connection between prayer and the hour, now this moment, that is this moment, gives one much spirituality, deepness, and all during prayer. It imparts a feeling of responsibility for the moment. It makes one say, I won't wait for tomorrow to pray. I will pray now with spirituality. I must feel that I will meet with the Lord now. There is no guarantee that I can meet him later. I, will, I want to rise now. I want to hear his voice now while I'm praying so as to rise and do what is good and lead a new life. Consequently, I won't fear the other hour. Paul the Apostle uses the same idea in Romans chapter 13. And do this, knowing the time. That's verse 11. Let's discuss the meaning of knowing the time. Do any of you know when is the time? You know that the time is unknowable. In the first church, the idea of time was preached a lot back then. So in this verse, Paul the Apostle says that you know the topic of time, so you don't need me to tell you again that no one knows the time. You already know that the time of life's end is unknown. He continued saying, that now is high time to awake out of sleep. He is talking about the same idea here. Since neither do I know when the end of my life would be, nor what the future holds, I must wake up now. That is, I must pray now. Now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Meaning, as long as we grow older, redemption approaches, so we take the chance now. It is said that this verse in particular was the reason behind the conversion of St. Augustine. St. Augustine remained for a year or more studying the Bible and argued with St. Ambrose. Previously, St. Augustine was a philosopher, and St. Ambrose was a very wise bishop. St. Augustine continued to argue with him, and the bishop told him to read and pray. Read and pray. Yet, being a philosopher, St. Augustine read the Bible and objected to many parts of it. Then, on a night while he was reading the Bible, he came to this part and read these two verses and then burst into tears. He felt that these words were knocking on his heart, urging him to wake up. And it truly happened. It was the first time for him to kneel down and pray and repent. After that, he went to St. Ambrose, asking for baptism. This was the beginning of the conversion of St. Augustine, who was a sinful philosopher, but became a great bishop. Let's go back to John 17. In verse 1, glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. Theologically, there is something called hypostatic mutual glory. So what does this mean? Let me tell you something about Arius. Before the crowd in Nicene, citing the verse, O Father, glorify thou me, Arius argued that the son derives his glory from the father. Therefore, the son is inferior to the father. Then St. Athanasius told him to go back to this verse, Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. Meaning, that glory is mutual be between both of them. So you can't say that the Son is inferior to the Father just because he asked him for glory. Arius comprehended it in a way that as long as the Son tells the Father so, this means that the Son is inferior and the Father is superior. Following Arius' line of thinking, does your son also may glorify you then mean that the son is superior to the father? Do you notice how the theological conflict goes? It goes when a heretic like Arius focuses on a certain verse and understands it in a wrong way. However, Athanasius' defense was based on the same context, making it clear that the glory is equal among the Trinity. We glorify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit equally as for the theology and the natures are equal among them. So back to chapter John 12. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore the people who stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Others also, others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. That's verse 28 to 32. 
What does now is the judgment of this world mean? We all know that the judgment will be held on the day of resurrection. Yet the day of judgment and the day of resurrection will be determined now. If I change my attitude today, the end result on the day of resurrection is known. And if now I neglect the Lord's voice for me to change and repent, the situation on the day of resurrection is also known. So when Christ said that the judgment of the world has been in the process since 2,000 years ago and the world has not yet ended, he meant that for each one of us the judgment is held now. So judge yourself today. The second thing is that glory is linked to the cross. So Christ said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Jesus gained the love of many people through his miracles, teachings, and his simplicity. However, this wasn't the glory he wanted to gain, for he wanted to gain the whole world when he was crucified. So he told the told people he wasn't waiting for the glory of the crowds, cheers around him, and the parade on Palm Sunday, and so on. For him, glory was the cross. That's why we notice that in the Holy Week, there are two kinds of glory. The first one was on Palm Sunday, when Jews made big celebrations to greet Jesus as a king when he came into Jerusalem. He went there riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey, so he was a very humble king. The second type of glory was on Good Friday. On that day, the glory further heightened when we chant, Thine is the power, the glory, the blessing, and the majesty forever. I mean, this reflects that the glory of the earthly kingship was very humble on Sunday as the people considered Jesus their king, which enraged the Jews, that is, the Jewish leaders. However, Jesus said, This isn't the glory I wanted to gain. I don't want worldly glory, for I will get the whole glory when I am lifted onto the wood of the cross. He said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. Why? Because God will be glorified when he saves mankind. So when he draws all men unto him and takes them to heaven, he will be glorified. In the same context we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. What does hallowed be your name and thy kingdom come mean? Who would hallow whom? Would we hallow God's name? How shall we do this as long as holiness belongs to him? The idea is that when we turn unto the Lord and stick with him, he is glorified and hallowed because he has done what he wanted to do. The thing that makes God most happy is the salvation and repentance of mankind. Hence, when, when you repent and turn unto the Lord, you glorify him, hallow his name, and make him happy. If the whole world remained away from God, his name would be degraded. It seems as if God is defeated and the devil has won. We want God to win, so we will follow him. Thus, when we tell the Lord, hallowed be thy name, We are telling him by implication that we belong to him. We are on his side. Romans 8, 17. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Isaiah chapter 43 says, I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. That's verse 6 and 7. A young man told me once that this verse enraged him, asking, Has God created me to use me to gain glory? I told him that he didn't get the meaning of glory. God doesn't need glory. God will be glorified when you are glorified. When a father witnesses the greatness of his son, even greater than himself, would he feel jealous? Of course not. He would be really delighted. When God says, I have created him for my glory, he means that he is glorified when the man created by him is glorified. Man can't be glorified unless he is attached to Christ, and he can't be attached to Christ without the cross. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. So the idea here is that we don't glorify God just by saying, glory be to you. This is the weakest way to glorify God. 
We, what God wants from us is to belong to him and make dozens to follow him. That's why the Lord says, I have created him for my glory. Christ says, how can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? John 5, 44. This is to convey the idea that the thing that hinders his honor most is being distracted by the worldly honor. He is saying, how can you believe in me so long as you keep glorifying and honor each other? As long as you seek worldly glory and honor, you can't receive my honor. Is that clear or not? I mean, what hinders our connection with God is that we care about others' opinions, or we want others to see us as great as possible, or we care about wearing the best clothes, or we want to be the richest or the most famous. All of that is called receiving honor from one another. Whoever is busy with these things is neglecting God's glory. That's why God asked, how can you receive my glory when you accept honor from one another? Let's go back to John 17 when Jesus was talking to the Father, saying, Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him, as this is eternal, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus Christ incarnated and became a man like us with his divinity unseparated, And because he is speaking using the language of us humans, he says, you have given him, he should give. These words are always said in our prayers as well. You tell God, you gave me so that I may give others. You gave me health to serve others, knowledge to give others, love to distribute. Thus you thank God in your prayers for what he has given you to give to others. The Christian man is a channel that transfers God's gifts to humankind. If this is your attitude, you are following Christ's path. He says, you have given him, he should give. So do you question yourself in your prayers? God, you have given me much, but I have kept it. Your grace stopped with me. Otherwise, you can be happy that you have received so that you can give. What does authority mean in verse 2? You have given him authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to those to as many as you have given him. Jesus himself says, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. That's Luke 10, 19. If we believe in this verse, we will never be afraid of anything. Sadly, we don't believe in it. God has given us his divine authority to be stronger than all evil forces. They can't beat us. That's why it upsets me when some people tell me that they are affected by magic and stuff. That's not our language at all, and these thoughts are inappropriate for the sons of God. If we believed in these things, we would be giving Satan value that he doesn't deserve. Christ says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Luke 10, 18. So when we become afraid of magic or envy and stuff like that, we are giving value to Satan, although Christ has degraded him. So remember that you are authorized to say, Our Father, God himself, with his authority, is your Father. You have the authority to beat Satan, not to be beaten by him, because the natural circumstance in the New Testament is that you are the winner. Expelling Satan is not difficult. Signing the cross expels Satan, and the Jesus prayer expels Satan. It is not difficult. He should give eternal life to as many as you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So what is the relationship between prayer and eternal life? True prayer is a moment of eternal life. True, heartfelt prayer is a deposit on eternal life. So when you pray from your heart, you are putting your foot in the door of heaven. You are starting to know how heaven tastes, as much as you can while in this world but you are still limited and restrained by your body because praying is a way to get you through to the other world. It's an unlimited and eternal line with God. That's why when we talk about knowing God, we say that eternal life is to know God. Some would say that we already know God. I'd say if you really know him, then you have started your eternity. And how can you know him? You can know him by speaking to him. 
Praying is just the start of eternity. So whoever doesn't pray doesn't relate by any means to eternal life and the other world is completely unknown to them. But whoever prays properly, they view moving from this world to heaven as a small issue because it's normal for them and they don't get surprised by the idea. Eternal life is the force of praying. As St. Moses the Black said, think of heaven so you would feel longing for it. Each time you pray, think of yourself sitting with Jesus, Mary, and angels. This idea will make us remember them and motivate us to pray and impart the praying spirit. St. Augury said, if you pray, you are a theologian. A definition of theologian is someone who knows God. And the spiritual definition of theologian doesn't mean someone who investigated nor studied who God is, but someone who prays. That means there are two ways of knowing God. One way is with books and studies, but this isn't our topic because God isn't a piece of information, nor is he a complex equation that we get in, in a master's degree. Nowadays, there are atheist theologians abroad. You may get amazed because he, he is called a theologian professor at some university, but he is an atheist. How, how come he is teaching theology and he is an atheist? I don't get it. Ah, he is teaching theology as just a science. He presents what Christians believe about God and what Muslims believe, Buddhists have no God, and the Hindu belief, and so on. So he is a scholar in theology, but he doesn't really know God because he follows books. You may meet an illiterate person, but he knows God very well. Why? A theologist. A brilliant theologian because he knows him by heart, knows him in person, he dealt with him, lived with him, and he talks to him day and night. So when he says something about God, he says it as if he is talking about a friend. Do you see the difference? So God doesn't like at all to be known through books. Matthew eleven twenty-five 25 and 26. You have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. So the main tool to know God is to pray. Do you want to know God well? Talk to him. Don't hear about him. Don't read about him. Talk to him. By the way, this is the most preferred method in evangelism. If you deal with a non-believer and they start to read the Bible, early on you should advise them saying, talk to God and he will answer you. Try this way when you deal with foreigners, for example, who are atheists. Sometimes they start by the logic, they read the Bible and start thinking, there are a lot of good parts and some ununderstandable parts. Tell them if God has created us and he is present and capable of talking with you, try talking to him and see. They will get shocked a bit and ask if that's real. Well, he's a person, isn't he? How would you know someone exists other than that? Knowing someone starts with chatting one-on-one. -on -one. So when he or she starts talking to God in their own way, by their naivety, they will feel that God is answering them. That's why the Bible says, No one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 16, 17. A divine announcement is a must. God must personally deal with the human so he would know him. And that can't happen without prayers. John 17, 4 and 5. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to, no to do. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself and with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Can we say, that, can we say the part of, I have finished the work which you have given me to do in our prayer or not? Of course not, because we didn't complete our work. What I mean is, God has asked us to do some things. And when we pray, it's like we are reporting to God. We apologize for not doing all what he asked us to do. So, for example, the day has ended and you'll soon sleep. So you say to God, the things you asked me to do, then stay silent a bit to think about how much you did. Jesus has completed it because he is perfect. So he receives the full marks every day, 10 out of 10. If you got 2 out of 10, that's good. Maybe tomorrow you will get 3 out of 10. So the idea of prayer is reporting. <clears throat> I report to God and say, you brought me here in life to do some things that I haven't done 
or done some of them but couldn't finish the rest, so help me tomorrow to finish them. You sent me a person today to reassure him, but I was busy. You sent me a situation to learn from, but I didn't understand. You sent me someone saying something, and I ignored it, and I got nervous because of a small situation. Finish the sentence. The things you asked me to do, and then finish the sentence with your own words. We say, I've fallen short to do it, but we need to get to, I've done it all, meaning, I want to do what you want me to do. O oh, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. So it's like in each prayer, there is automatic accountability of oneself. If you pray from your heart, the Holy Spirit will have you review your day or your deeds without you even realizing it. We sometimes advise people to take accountability of their deeds before praying and see what you did or did not do well. That's good. However, if we spontaneously and spiritually prayed, all of that happens automatically. Some, some situation on that day may ring a bell in your head during prayer of which you may think, how did I miss that? Because of this moment, the Holy Spirit is what talks to you during prayer. How could I get nervous in that situation? Or how could I gossip about people? Why did I miss that a chance to do that good thing when I had the time? All of that comes to your head while praying as you find out that God wanted to use you to do some good things, but you didn't give him the chance. John 17, 6 and 7 I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were, they were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. We may observe the repetition of the words, you gave me, because Jesus teaches us that all that happens in our life is a gift from God. You, God, gave me life, children, health, people, good conditions, and service. All of that you gave me to do things according to your plan, and I should have done them as you wanted. Jesus says, I have manifested your name to them. So have you manifested the name of Jesus to people or not? Then he says, they have kept your word. There is a connection here between the word and the spirit of prayer. The more you are busy with the Bible, the better your prayer will become, because the word of God gives spirit to, to the prayer. Imagine that you are pleased with the verse that says, all things work together for good, from Romans 8.28. And you say, I know, God, that all what happens around is good. So what adds flavor and meaning to your prayer is the words in the Bible. Or maybe there's a commandment which you weren't able to do. So you say, Lord, I didn't love him. Thus, the commandment you couldn't do became the theme of your prayer in this example. John 17, 8 and 9. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. We observe that Jesus, in the first part of the prayer, was talking about his relationship to the Father, saying, Glorify me, and I glorify you. You gave me, and I gave them. Then he says, for them I pray. Listen, anybody who prays with the Spirit, his heart spontaneously prays for people. That's why the person who doesn't pray for others doesn't pray with the Spirit because the Holy Spirit makes your heart so wide and euphoric that you are no longer self-centered. As a beginner in prayer, a, per a person prays for himself, his health, his children, and that's it. But when you reach higher levels of prayer, you start praying from your heart for your neighbor, for your relative, and when you get even more advanced in praying, you pray for the revolution, the epidemics, the droughts, and your heart becomes bigger spontaneously. Meaning, you don't force yourself and pretend, nor do you remind yourself. You just find it coming out without being prompted. The more you get into prayer with reverence, the more the Holy Spirit, or the master of the prayer, makes you think of those who suffer and makes you feel for others. You forget yourself and focus on others. That's the normal sequence in prayer. I pray for them. Notice that Jesus doesn't pray for himself. He says, they have believed that you sent me. 
Another thing we tend to forget but remember while praying is that we are here in this life for a short time to carry out a mission or to deliver a message. Then we finish and go back home. Do you usually consider this thought? That is, that you are here for some time for some special and specific message to deliver. Then you're going back home. You are not an ordinary human. You belong to Jesus Christ. You are the light of the world as God is. You have a godly soul. So the idea of the words, you sent me, would be clearer and you would, will learn that meaning each time you pray from the heart because apart from praying, when one is living his ordinary life, he may think that he is ordinary and that and that's his life and he will continue without purpose and everything in this materialistic life is of no importance to them. However, during prayer, one recalls that he does not belong here, that he is here temporarily for a specific message, that he will leave. Therefore, meanings are spontaneously composed inside us while praying. John 17, 10, 11. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. The same aforementioned idea for the words, I am no more in the world, which is, the more you pray from the heart, the more you remember that there will come a day when you will leave this life, and that thought will never be overshadowed. Then he continues, and I come to you. Subsequently, prayer makes you feel like this, and you will eventually pray for people and find out that your prayers for them are focused on one thing which is summed up in the words, keep them in your name. This verse means that it doesn't matter how long they live, how much they earn, how famous they may become, but what is essential is to keep them yours, Lord. This discourse applies to your children, your neighbors, your relatives, and to all the world soon. The Holy Spirit makes you take your focus away from your personal needs, makes you think and pray for others, and makes you busy in prayer with one request, their eternity, that is, their longing for heaven. O oh Lord, keep them in your name, is the most important thing. Despite Jesus' prayers for the apostles, they were tortured and were severely exhausted. However, they were all kept in heaven. Then Jesus goes on and says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. As mentioned before, there are some meanings that emerge while praying, such as feeling for others, praying for them, and thinking of their spirituality. Also, there will always be a taste of delight in prayer. Real prayer must evoke gladness. Although it was the night of crucifixion and Jesus had told people that he would leave and they were so upset to the point Jesus assured them he would not abandon them to be orphans and that the Holy Spirit would give them power and there was an atmosphere of tension for them and after an hour he would give the, the Gethsemane talk which was filled with acute pain. However, despite all this, prayer is filled with joy. Therefore, he says, And these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Accordingly, if, we f if you feel the presence of God in your prayer, you will unpromptedly feel gladness. That's why the verse says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. 1 Thess Thessalonians 5, 16-18 These three are causes and effects of one another. If you express gratitude and pray, then you will feel joy. John 17, 14, and 15. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Several years ago, we held numerous conferences about the Christian person in the world. We let attendees memorize four principles, principal words about the true Christian. First, he is indifferent. Second, he is rejected. Third, he exists because he is the owner of a mission. The last one came from this point. Jesus says, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So you, as a Christian, must not belong to this world. That is to say, you are different. 
The moment there is no obvious difference between you and the others, there is something wrong. You have diverted your prayer. You should be different all the time. Whoever sees you should feel you're extraordinary. Your look is different. Your smile is different. Your speech is different. Your character is different. Your principles are different. You are not from this place. I am not of the world. If a foreigner comes in here now, all of us will notice him immediately. Jesus Christ says the same about his followers, that they are not of the world because I am not of the world, and they are the same as me. I am not of the world, neither are they. So that is the first matter you should be thinking of every now and then. Am I different or do I think like everybody else? The second thing, it's normal that you'll be rejected. The world doesn't like those who are different, nor those who have principles. The world isn't in favor of those who have truthfulness, honesty, purity, and holiness. Don't get surprised or shocked. That's normal. So should we leave the world? No, stay. But as Jesus says in John 17 and 18, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. So stay in the world. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. In prayer, a Christian's equation gets reprogrammed. In prayer, you think, am I different from others? In prayer, you think, is that why the world rejects me? In prayer, you think, should I stay in the world? Yes, you should. But why? The world doesn't want me, and I do not belong here. Because you have a mission, to love people and to be like Jesus for the rest of your life. Jesus Christ prays for us that we reach this state, and you will feel this or discover this during prayer. The last part. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. As discussed, your circle of prayer enlarge, enlarges from your people and your close ones to unknown people whom you never met nor heard. The purpose is that we all gather together in heaven at, la at, at last so that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you, have, that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Insisting on our heavenly future is a primary thing to ask for in each prayer. The desire that should fill your heart at the end of each prayer is, Lord, may we all gather together in heaven. May nobody be missed. May I and everyone around me reach that place, and we all continue being there with you forever. This is a spontaneous insistence that, that spouts during praying. Notice the repetition of, so that we all be one in you and be beside you forever. Thus, if such a feeling does not emerge in you while praying, then it means you haven't yet reached a deep point of faith. And glory to God forever. Amen.